everyone, and welcome to the AAGT Inform Series, Responding with Solutions for Gifted Education in Uncertain Times. This is our fourth episode, Common Characteristics and Behaviors of Gifted Students that Require Special Accommodations in Curriculum and Instructional Practices. And we want to remind you to please ask any questions in the Q&A section and that those would be will be answered at the end of the presentation. We want to apologize for having to miss last week. Um, Dr. Belgian has agreed to join us perhaps again in September and we'll be sure to get him on our schedule because what he has to say is of such value to us. So thank you. Heather, should we go to the next slide? All right. We encourage you to become a member of AAGT. We are the only advocacy group for gifted education and our gifted students in Arizona. Um, we can always use your help. We wanna keep you informed. So please go to arizonagifted.org and join us. All right, we have a new date for the 2020 AAGT Parent Institute, and it will be held on October 2nd, 17th, 2020, and it will be virtual. We are now looking for presenters for the breakout sessions. If you're interested in that, again, go to arizonagifted.org and find out more. We hope you can join us. Next week, you can look forward to hearing from Scott Hagerman and Peter Lang. Peter is the Deputy Associate Superintendent, Educator in School Excellence at the Arizona Department of Education. And Scott Hagerman is a superintendent in Tanker Verde Unified School District. And they're going to be talking about the impact of school options on high ability learners. And this will include online, in person, um, how we present our curriculum and instruction for our gifted students and the impact uh, uh, that any kind of decision is made for options for school will have on our high ability learners. So be sure and, and join us next Wednesday, July 29th at four. This past spring, you may have realized that when the legislature adjourned early, they passed only a skinny budget and gifted was not included in that skinny budget. So we knew we had to find a way to keep the needs of gifted in the conversation when folks were deciding um, about how education dollars will be spent in the next school year. So we created a new narrative that we're gonna share with you today and hope that you will pick up on that and enjoy sharing it in your school districts. When decisions are made in regard to how education dollars are spent, please remember gifted students are uniquely vulnerable and their academic and social and emotional needs should be part of the discussion as are the needs of other vulnerable groups of students. The AAGT Inform series was born out of our commitment to address the vulnerabilities of our gifted students and provide solutions for their learning path so everyone who carries this message to school district administrators has a tool, have the tools and the talking points to make it happen. So don't be shy, go to your school district, go to your administrators, talk to them about, we need to remember how to accommodate the unique learning differences of our gifted students. So thank you for doing that. Um, I'd like to move on now to our presentation for today and we're gonna turn the, um, oh, well, and our speakers are Connie Crowley and Donna Campbell. I'm advocacy chair for AAGT and I'll introduce Connie in just a moment. So I think Connie can take the screen now. Okay, well, it was there a second ago. Show. Go to slideshow and it'll start. Yeah, it was, it, I think this is opening oh. in a different format. Okay. So we'll have to try that. Here we go. go. There we go, that's okay. Right. Very good. So uh, as Connie and I were talking about this, um, we agreed that um, giftedness is revealed through 
characteristics and behaviors of students over time. Um, so it's important to recognize these gifted uh, behaviors and characteristics so that they can be nurtured. And we decided on four of them that we're going to uh, focus on for today that Connie will share some strategies and tips to accommodating those. Um, Connie, you wanna go to the next one? So I do wanna introduce our good friend, Connie uh, Crowley. She is a mom and a grandma to gifted children and has educated gifted students for over 25 years. She's a teacher in the Liberty School District her self-contained gifted classroom includes students in grades three, four, five, and six. Did everybody hear that? She has four grade levels in her classroom. Connie is well equipped to share insights on accommodating the learning needs of her diverse group of students. And her strategies and activities are well suited for online and in-person classrooms. And I think you're gonna really enjoy this session. Okay, so next slide, Connie. Thank you. So the, the, whoops, I think we skipped one in there. Um, okay. Do you, okay. We'll go, go ahead, go ahead. The four that we're going to talk about are the excellent memory, advanced language skills, accelerated rate of learning, and analytical thinking. And we felt like these were the best ones to talk about because they so much impact what you do and how you plan for, in curricula for curriculum and instruction with these students. Okay, Connie, take it away. Hey. Um, so one of the things that we want to look at is, um, you know, initial assessments. You want to validate where is the student, where are they at for all their learning levels, and um, you want to be able to start there so that you know where to appropriately place them and challenge them. Uh, so one of the things that I happen to use, which is a free resource out there um, and included at the end of the session, is a SATS and math placement. What I like here about this is that um, you don't necessarily have to use SATS and math, but it'll, it'll definitely give you a good idea about the um, student's abilities and it's not super overbearing. So they happen to have uh, several different areas to um, begin with. So if you're um, early elementary, they've got the K3 placement and then that 5-4 um, and then they go into the um, beginning algebra and then they actually go, go all the way through upper grade um, math placement. So this will give you a good initial look at where your kids are at. Um, one of the things though about what I really love about this typical Saxon math program is that it offers students a small incremental learning moments where it's not that same repetitive, 30 problems and it gives them a little bit more to you know retrieve and it spirals so that it keeps it interesting to them so it's not the exact same way all the time and it brings about great discussion uh, students are able to uh, take this and have great math discussion uh, talking about how did they solve it in different ways because in this program it doesn't offer just one particular uh, way to solve a problem. So um, with this, we've looked at how we can utilize this and I use uh, this appropriate challenge with a math journal. It is a way for them to be self-directed and it gives them something to bring to small group. They are able to take that math concept and again, spiral it and they'll see it come back in their uh, work and they are going to use uh, different things from mental math to critical thinking and definitely uh, that m multiple method. So here's a little sample of just a little warm up that they do just on their own before they ever come. And then we actually uh, discuss this, these little small problem solving pieces. This is, a, this is out of a, a fifth grade level book that I use, um, which is actually uh, more closely aligned to the six, seven standards. So um, my students generally are two years above grade level. Um, here's an example of one of my students' math journals. And you can see they have their objective up there. They're writing in their vocabulary so that they have something to come back to. 
um, so they have a resource, so they're building themselves a resource, and then they're writing in examples on how to uh, solve using, again, a couple different methods there for prime factorization. Uh, that spiral concept definitely allows them to, uh, you see here there's five different questions and they're using, you know, everything from conversions in, you know, uh, to ratios to solving, you know, ad addition with uh, addition multiplication and or um, sales tax. So they're just, they're utilizing a lot of different skills with that spiral concept of previously taught material. And this is a little bit light to see, but then this would be the actual lesson practice. And there were only four questions that they had to um, get, give me. And then what I do here is this is where I analyze to see um, if they have that concept um, or not. And then it gives me an opportunity to pull them for a small group if need be. Um, We'll talk okay. a little bit more about. Um, did, okay, we're going to do uh, talk about advanced language skills because we felt like um, the extensive vocabulary that some of these kids had lends itself to um, making adjustments in our instruction in our, our curriculum. Um, they like to use the precise language of a discipline. So if they have a passion or an interest in something and they've spent a lot of time researching it, they will often come up with those you know, $10 words because um, the, it's important to them to learn the vocabulary. Um, they express their insights through analogies, metaphors, and similes. And as Connie and I were talking, she had some great examples of, of her children doing that. Um, of course, with advanced language skills, they talk and they ask a lot of questions. And uh, sometimes this is can, can uh, prove problematic in the classroom, um, especially as as how quickly they raise their hand, how they um, make connections in their brain and they want to go down a rabbit hole of something else that they want to discuss. So um, what we need here with kids with advanced language skills is to access higher level reading material, um, especially nonfiction, areas of passion and interest, and they need teacher time. They need time and help in challen challen channeling their questions and their energy. Honey? Okay, so um, with this, I um, kind of have a reading routine for them that they um, utilize, and this can overlay with just about any kind of um, stories, short stories uh, in particular. And I use this so that through the week, they know what they're, they're going to do. They can do it independently, but it all culminates to the main important thing, which is their Socratic seminar in which they come and they share their thoughts, their ideas, and have some really great in-depth discussions. And it's just amazing to watch these guys uh, work inside my classroom with this. Um, as they get to spend several years with me, it, they just, it's a, it becomes a really natural thing for them and uh, they do a really great job. So with this, um, I happen to use the Junior Great Book series and um, I actually usually have at least three different uh, reading levels with inside my, my classroom. And I can use this same format for each uh, particular story. And it really makes it nice because the kids are all kind of doing the same similar things, but they're definitely working um, with their material at their own um, needed uh, level. So with this, you can see uh, that it just has a little place where they can begin to read the story, kind of make some connect connections to the self or world. And um, I don't have them, you know, write a big, huge summary, just need to know the gist, what's the meat and the potato, the meat and potatoes of the story there. And um, I have them mark uh, their text so that whether it's something that, you know, they want to come back to for discussion later, uh, whether it be just with their um, small group or if it uh, is something they want to talk with me about, they're, they're able to uh, go through this reading routine. So this just happens to be the front page sample, but if you look the five tabs uh, below, they kind of work you through the five different days in which Basically, they're going to work together. They're going to work independently. They're going to work together 
and then they're going to come to uh, with just like a partner and then they're going to come together in a whole group so it gives them a little bit of um support and yet also gives them freedom to have some independence with this um, one of the things i want to know is not always do these kids always fit exactly in their grade level when it comes to their abilities. And I have this little boy that was in my classroom that uh, he came in and he was, he was a couple years below in reading according to his grade level and he was a couple years advanced in math. So when we look at that, we have to remember that those kiddos uh, aren't going to be high in everything necessarily. And sometimes they are, which is, you know, uh, uh, great too. But this little guy came in and he was very embarrassed that he was below grade level and he was re having to read books with another group and so on and so forth. So one of the things that I really um, like to talk about is fostering that uh, emotional security to be together in a group that, you know, we're all there to learn and we all have our individual goals. And so we don't judge each other. We, we, we really are there to support each other and how can we help each other and build each other up. And it's such a great um, community. And you really got to start building that from the get go because it's really sometimes when you get these kids that are a couple years behind, they, they really, um, struggle inside to to be comfortable inside of a classroom so the positive note to that is if you can build that environment that little guy grew two years of um, reading in one year and i just couldn't be more pleased with the progress that he had made um, that year once he could just uh, release that and let that go uh, so um, within here too, we get to the day where they have Socratic seminar and they come together and they sit and they talk and they're basically uh, talking about this story, making connections to the, to the world, to their selves, and they're really bringing full part meaning. But what they do often do inside this group is they have difficulty learning to listen to each other. <laughs> so one of the biggest takeaways for them is to listen to each other and then internalize what it is they're trying to say and try to take some kind of ownership to acknowledge uh, that person's thoughts and ideas and and you know kind of make them feel at ease in being to um, in their sharing because sometimes they come across a little gruff. Um, Oh, I don't believe you. That's not right. And I, and I know that because on page and they, <laughs> and, and they just have a tendency to want to be that way. And so we do a lot of work with um, giving them that opportunity to uh, be reflective and uh, try to, you know, come across with some understanding by asking each other more questions. Well, how do you feel that was the case? Can you show me an example of where you thought and get them really using some great dialogue. So um, this is a, a great opportunity for them to use that ability to talk in a positive way that um, brings them together in their work. So, um, and within this too, uh, the last day after their Socratic seminar, and they've had this opportunity to have all this great dialogue and um, really kind of build their knowledge base of this story. The, the final day, uh, the fifth day happens to be a day where they uh, write about reading. And there, I give them two different type of prompts that can even either have an expository or they can have a um, creative, uh, question uh, question to answer and so depending on you know the mood they feel or the type of kid that they are they want to give me the facts they'll choose whichever option that is and they they um, really uh, develop great writing skills through writing about reading oh i am so sorry i didn't even flip <laughs> <laughs> the screen i'm way ahead of myself so so anyway this is the the routine here and Donna. All right. Thank you. So just a reminder that um, all of Connie's resources are available and I believe Heather, our executive director, sent them in a folder to all the participants. So um, uh, you'll be able to find them there. So the next one that we talked about was the accelerated rate of learning. And we, we really felt like this was important. Um, Arizona does have um, 
uh, policy or an allowance for acceleration in our schools. And in my experience, it isn't used very much. But, um, you know, we all know we can accelerate grade level, we can accelerate by subject, uh, we can do lots of things in the classroom. The reason why acceleration is important uh, the accelerated rate of learning is important to address is they need little repetition for a mastery. It takes them, you know, maybe zero to one time to get a concept, whereas everyone else in their, um, in their uh, classroom, uh, it may take as much as eight to 10. So therein lies the problem. What do we do with the kid who gets it the first time seeing a skill or a piece of information and uh, while everyone else is taking that much longer for mastery? So that's one of the issues. Another one is uh, they perform or have the potential to perform above their grade level peers. So we, we have to remember that, um, as Connie said in her example of her little guy, is that not all gifted kids are performing at a high level in everything, um, but that they have the potential to perform above their grade level peers. And we want to nurture those behaviors again. And another part of this is to comprehend symbols so much. It's very easy for a lot of these kids to comprehend symbols and, and to make up symbol representations, letters, numbers, maps, music, and so on. So um, sometimes they take notes that way. Sometimes they use them um, to remember things, but um, at any rate, we will see them grasp onto some of these concepts very quickly. So how do we address that, Connie? So again, acceleration is going to require that we are going to definitely have to do some initial assessments for our, uh, placement. And sometimes I know like district assessments don't really tell the whole picture because they're just assessing that grade level skill. So if they're a third grader, they're taking that third grade assessment and yet this child may be, you know, two years past that third grade assessment. So it'll show what what my test results generally show is that my kids know everything on day one for the grade level that they may exist. So it's definitely important to uh, try to find those other things that you can use, such as like that Saxon math um, piece to uh, appropriately assess and place them. Uh, Acceleration also is going to require you to be thinking as a teacher about your flexible grouping. Uh, like I explained about my little guy who was below in grade level for reading, you know, being able to not only allow him to work with his readiness group for reading, but also to work with his other um, peer groups, uh, age group to, you know, accommodate that validation and need there. Acceleration uh, definitely can leave gaps though. That's one of the problems that we find when we accelerate students. And so what happens sometimes is that when I get kids into my classroom, they've been accelerated and kind of skipped a grade maybe sometimes. And so some foundational skills kind of um, get, uh, go by the wayside. So it's really important that um, we're we're monitoring that and we're, we're filling in those gaps. And um, small group instruction, is uh, always important and uh, can both be student initiated as well as teacher initiated. So some tools that I, I use to do some of these um, things, uh, when this pan pandemic struck, I was so fortunate to have a, a good grasp with my students already to use Google, Google Classroom. And they were very fluid and they were already using it. So for for us, we just kept on going like nothing else. So we like, we've never missed a, a beat. And uh, as you can see, here's an example. These were the uh, classes that I continue to hold um, during that period. And uh, I had fourth, fifth and sixth grade. And then I actually had a combination four, five, six classroom as well, uh, so that I, we could put up things that were pertinent to the whole entire group. Uh, however, if you didn't want to have something like that, you can actually, uh, through Google Classroom, assign. So if I just had, for example, my 15 students in the fourth through um, sixth grade, and I eliminated that fourth, fifth, and sixth grade group, if I did a math assignment, for example, and I usually generally use general terms so that we're all on the same page. So today's uh, math lesson would be today's date, for example, um, math and today's date. And they just, they 
came quickly to understand how that worked. Uh, but what would happen is that if I just had that four, five, six classroom, I could actually check um, by going up into the little dots up in the right hand corner, I could actually change and check which students I wanted to assign which math um, uh, assignments. And I could upload just to uh, three of those kids or seven of these kids. So you can um, differentiate the work through one assignment ba based on um, the exact same assignment. And so that's another way that you can go about doing that. Uh, it was really fun during that time though, because as some of my kids would have problems, they would post up questions to each other. And uh, it, they, sometimes they would solve their own problems before I ever even got to them because they, they were the, somebody was already online and I wasn't. And they, they ch checked out the question and they're like, oh, Mrs. Crowley said, or this was over here, or that was, <laughs> so it was, um, that's do this. So they um, definitely worked well together through that. And um, they can also upload their work. So for example, their math journals where I used to look at those in person, I couldn't anymore. We continued our same routines. I would have them send me a screenshot of um, that work and upload it into the classroom. And then I could take a peek uh, before our uh, meeting the next day. Uh, Google Meets was the um, new piece for all of this during the pandemic. And it, you know, again, allowed us to have that place for live lessons. Um, we carried out all of the things that we would do together, uh, sitting in a small group or large group through, through the um, Google Meet, such as the Socratic Seminar. Uh, we also do some projects. And during this time, these projects were able to be presented by the students. I let them take over the screen and they actually did, did their presentations um, live. We invited all of our parents to come sit in front of the screens with us. And it also allowed them to do some small group collaboration. So back to filling in those gaps. One of the things that I I'm fortunate to have within our district is this IXL program. Um, it's an, a, um, computer generated program students again are assessed based on their um, readiness to move forward in math. And sometimes it, what it finds is um, some low uh, points. And you can kind of see uh, that little piece there on the screen, uh, those little dots and it shows, you know, kids, you know, higher in certain areas and lower in other. And so it's really a great way because it's personalized. And it's, uh, it's all done pretty much hands off for the teacher. The only thing that I really do with this is I monitor it because when I see students struggle, I can pull, pull small groups um, or sometimes it, it's just an independent uh, meeting to actually work through some of the issues the student may be having. So that makes it really nice for me to fill in their gaps. And Donna. Okay. Thank you, Connie. So um, we also talked about analytical thinking as um, a characteristic that we have to think carefully about. These kids that think critically and logically can be very intense. They can be very focused. Uh, we know that they need time to think. Um, rather than a faster pace and acceleration, they may need a slower pace. Um, the things that work for them are self-directed and in-depth learning. They like open-ended activities, may they may respond well for that. And also we know um, that they do need an opportunity for reflection. So Connie's gonna share some of her strategies for the analytical thinkers. So um, we do project-based learning in my classroom and we also uh, uh, utilize a program that I'll talk about here in a second. But um, this is a great resource here for uh, designing a project-based model and kind of what the role is. And so I call this the their independent genius hour. And we, we generally can get in uh, most days a 50 minute to an hour session uh, where the students can begin to promote um, exploration of their own interests, 
Um, they also can have flexible work time because if they're done early, early finishers, those kind of things, this is a great way for them to fill their time in a positive manner. So this is one of my go-tos. I can, uh, if they're, they're done with everything for the day and it's, you know, now 1130 and we're going to go to lunch and we're going to come back and they have, and, you know, two hours on their hands. This is a good thing that um, they can do because it's, it's never ending. They finish one project and they can move into another. And uh, so it's student directed and they choose everything that they want to work on, including the outcomes, what it, what it is they would like to know by the end of this. And they get to present and they love taking center stage and presenting their material. And some don't. So we present, uh, they can create things to put out for others to look at and um, share that um, together. So uh, this particular one, uh, there's the, it's a, the seven steps there and the formulation of those expected outcomes, understanding the concept of the material. And sometimes I have to help them get some of that material because uh, it's not readily available, but most of the time they're, they're pretty creative between the library and um, what they can get to on the internet. Um, skills, the, the skills that they want to have by, with that um, learning. And then the actual project work, creating a theme for it. Uh, they actually make the proposal for this. They execute the task of this project. And then, like, like I said, that final presentation. And the most important part to this is that the teacher's role is really just that motivator, encouraging them, advising them, and guiding them to continue to work on this uh, project. Sometimes they get stuck and you just need to give them a little pep talk. You've got this. Um, so what else could you, you know, you know, because they sometimes they're, they're like, well, I'm not finding the answer. So sometimes it just, you know, walking them through some other uh, strategies to find some of this. In my class, we um, use, um, her name is Mel Melody Bondi, and she has developed second through sixth grade um, these Envision projects. And it is uh, definitely really cool. The kids love them. They're a little bit more um, guided and they do three a year. We work on trimesters, so it works good for us to do three a year. Um, each book contains four real world based independent projects. Uh, they all align with Bloom's taxonomy and they definitely um, are educationally objective sound. Uh, they last about 10 weeks, depending on how you want to space this out. And each uh, project ends up with a portfolio, a display board. They have a formal classroom presentation. And then we have a big expo, invite our parents, other classrooms come, and they're able to, you know, sh be the shining stars and share, share their hard work. Uh, it includes a teacher's assessment as well as a, a, a student assessment as well which is really great for them to begin working on that self-assessment piece um, because they're all perfect <laughs> in their eyes. So, you know, sometimes it, it takes a little bit more um, pushing on the teachers and sometimes I'll give them mine and tell them to go back and look and, and see how, how they might um, use my teacher assessment to, to go back and reflect and they, they get so much better after two or three projects. So it's, it's pretty interesting to do with them. Uh, so here's an example of one of those projects. It's the travel passport and they, you know, have to basically find a destination that they want to travel to. They have to figure out, you know, the time they'll need to get there and spend their transportation, the gears, if they have pets, what are they going to do with their pets? Um, they create daily um, itineraries and the expense charts. And sometimes they're pretty funny about how much they think they're going to spend um, on these project, projects. Uh, uh, they are definitely uh, using computer generated um, things. So this is a great time to teach them not only to uh, create graphs on the computer, but um, they can create uh, things, their travel memoirs, they uh, create maps, postcards, and uh, three-dimensional things like, uh, say they're going to go to Mexico, they, they may create a pinata. So it's, it's a lot of fun and they really enjoy these projects. 
although they're very hard. And that's one thing I will say is quite the challenge. So um, with that, I would encourage you to reach out and uh, look at these. And that's also provided on the resource page. Yeah. Well, Connie, what a wealth of information. Thank you very much. Um, you certainly uh, live by the philosophy, if you give them a start and get out of their way, gifted kids will know what to do. And uh, I think that you've done a really good job preparing them to be self-directed learners, which is one of our goals. Um, do you find that there's a difference between their engagement online and in person or have both been pretty successful? So um, I found um, during the pandemic that the kiddos that were pretty good about participating in class were also pretty good about participating um, online and out of class. However, there were those that weren't showing up. And I feel, so for us, we weren't grading. Uh, we just kind of put the kibosh on grading and just kind of, you know, uh, continued to offer opportunities and, and such. But we weren't, we were so unsure about how do we move forward? Do we stay stagnant? And so there was a lot of struggle with that. And what I did notice is that uh, some of those kids realized because they are so smart that things weren't being graded because we weren't allowed to grade. So they were like, hmm, well, then why do it? <laughs> and so then they weren't, they were not uh, participating very well. I, I feel like um, I know going forward as school starts this time, uh, it, it'll be different for them because they'll, some are motivated because they have to be and um, some were motivated because they love to learn and couldn't wait to get to school, even if it was virtual. So um, of course, you've, you're always going to have both. And so I had to reach out to parents and say, hey, they're not showing up. And, you know, this is what time we're meeting every day. And uh, if they could just get in the habit and just try to get there, that'd be great. And um, it, it just depended. Sometimes, sometimes that motivation with a parent, you know, worked and sometimes it didn't. So there, there definitely were some struggles. Right. And, and I think we've heard that from a lot of teachers. It was a lack of engagement because they simply didn't have to do it. So yeah, we'll see what's happening here. Well, we do have a couple of questions on the Q&A. Um, uh, two of them have to do with Socratic seminar. And one of them specifically asks, what does that mean? So if you can give a little you know, uh, 101 on Socratic seminar. And then another one related to that said, uh, do you read together or do they read on their own and come to class prepared to discuss? So if you want to just give us a little background on Socratic Seminar. Yeah, so Socratic Seminar is, um, if, you, if you do any just quick Google Socratic Seminar, the, that's basically a philosophy of um, getting kids to um, be prepared to open for open dialogue discussion on um, anything and it can be it could be anything any kind of reading and so you know during that you want to be able to give them some of that time to be reflective that's why i give them this whole five day routine it's four day it's three days to prepare um, for the seminar. So the first day they're, you know, they're kind of independently reading it and kind of making their own, you know, injectures of what this is all about and, you know, how it relates to them. And sometimes for them, it's a time where, wow, I really didn't understand that, so on and so forth. So the second day, um, they're coming together to work with a partner. And during that partner read, we're working on oral fluency. Uh, so they're taking turns sharing um, the responsibility to read. And during that, they're also uh, taking time from the parts where they've marked where maybe they had something that they felt was interesting or maybe they were confused. And so they've got all these things marked and it's an opportunity for them to kind of get some clarification with a partner. And then the third day, when they're coming to Socratic seminar, uh, they're actually now having discussion and they're holding it without me. <laughs> and that's the interesting part because as teachers, we're so used to being the center of universe it's really hard for a lot of teachers to back off and just stay out. 
So I am merely a listener. I don't clarify. I don't get involved. Um, it is the hardest thing when they're learning this too, because, you know, they, they just want me to fix it. Well, if I tell, you know, like, well, Mrs. Crowley, I don't agree with it. And I said, no, no, you've got to look. So this is the great thing is they have to look at each other when they're talking all those skills that, you know, we forget sometimes in a regular classroom, we're all sitting, you know, square in our desk and we're raising our hand and we're talking to the teacher about these questions. This is them discussing. So they are developing their own questions about the story prior to coming. There, uh, there are some questions that I've given them that sometimes they bring up those questions, but it's the sky's the limit when they come together during Socratic seminar because it's really about discussing the story and getting in and digging deeper for meaning. So when they come together, um, you'll hear them say cute things because I do a lot of modeling in the beginning to get them going. And what's great again about me having them multiple years is I don't have to do that modeling anymore because I've got my models already in there. So the kids are just watching each other that are new to the classroom and they're learning that, that their role in that. So during the seminar, they're sitting in a circle and they're looking at each other. Uh, somebody can just, whoever decides that it's like natural conversation, whoever wants to start. So somebody might jump in and they learn to, sometimes they both jump in at the same time. And so they have to learn to do, be like natural, like, oh, go, you go ahead, you know, and it's really cute to watch them. So they'll, they'll um, have this great discussion about the book, asking each other questions. It's really cute because again, they'll say like rephrasing, I thought I heard you say blah, blah, blah. And so so how, wh how, what made you come to that conclusion? And so then that child jumps in and they're clarifying information. They're thumbing through their book. And um, well, on page seven, it said, and so I felt what that meant was, and so they're clarifying information. It's just a very rich conversation about, um, you know, reading and it's it's so supernatural and it's just really it's, it's a joy to watch them do struggle to get them there um, when you're you know doing this with a brand new group of kids every year it's a little bit of a struggle don't give up because it, it sometimes you you know for a while you'll jump in and you'll say you know they're it, they'll maybe be kind of grumpy with the one and oh that's not true they didn't say that and, da, da, da. <laughs> and then you have to kind of get involved and say no that's not how we're going to say that let's let's take this back so let's rephrase your question and you know so it's a it's a great experience and if you just google socratic seminar you're going to get um, they actually have programs that you can um, download yeah. Thank you for that. We have a couple other questions for that. Some are asking about seeing the other pages on the Google Sheet for days two through five, and that's available um, if they click on the link in your resources, correct? Yes, they have the whole thing there. All right, All very days. good. So yeah. um, we have another question about managing the student discussions online in Google Meets. Any other tips or discussions about managing student discussions on Google Meets? So um, in our district, we had decided right away because um, the kids could get in there without us. And so we had to, so there's a way that if you're the last person as the teacher that leaves the session, the session closes and they can't come back and open it again. And that requires you though, to put out a new um, uh, Google Meet every day so that they um, aren't going back in. Um, and rejoining uh, and, and getting there before the teacher. Honestly, I felt very comfortable that my kids would be okay doing that, uh, but I could definitely see where that could be problematic and you definitely wanna be there. I mean, we're in our homes and, you know, let's just, let's just face it, even, you know, in our own Zoom adult meetings, they've, you know, uh, uh, already started funny clips where, you know, they've had a, you know, the. The wife's presenting and the naked husband comes walking behind. <laughs> I mean, these things have happened. And so we just have to be realistic that the, the students are in their homes and you know they, they need to still have some monitoring and, and the teacher needs to be there to, to you know kind of control some of that. So, so specifically for the Socratic seminar, there's a question here. How does that work on Google Meet? Does it work really well? 
It does. It meets it just like we're sitting together. So if we happen to all be in the Google Meet at the same time, it worked just like sitting in person. A um, little more difficult for I, you know, the eye contact part. You know, like I'm looking at myself. This is hard to you know, this is hard to get used to looking at you. But you know, I got Don up on my screen too. So I, it, it definitely worked. Um, the kids did, the kids weren't shy about doing it. The problem that they had was they didn't get their second read with a partner because I couldn't, I couldn't manage all those Google meets by my, you know, partnering. So that was a problem. Uh, so they only had one read and that definitely for some of the students was a struggle because they didn't have that quiet one-to-one -one with a a partner to solidify their thinking before they came to Socratic seminar. So they sometimes were a little more shy with their, um, with their, with their thoughts about the text. So. Okay. Uh, a quick question. Are Melody Bondi's projects free? No, but they're not all that expensive. I think it's about $40 a book. Um, I haven't checked in a while. Uh, mine were bought when she first published them actually so um probably a good 10 years ago so um but i, I mean for for projects ten dollars a project you'll have them the nice thing is they come with um uh online resource where you can download stuff too so that you don't have to um you know, always have that book around. And then it also makes it easier to upload it to Google because it's already in that format. You don't have to go scanning it or anything like that. So that's kind of nice now. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have one more question about um, uh, parents um, asking questions and due dates and offering support. And what is the role of a parent, do you think, um, to support our gifted kids. And let's think about doing online. Yes. And I would, again, routine is key and expectations. So um, I would suggest establishing that routine, uh, you know, whether it be, you know, we're all getting up by nine o'clock to eat breakfast, I, I, whatever it is, establish that, you know, time and that routine, because that's what's going to make the child more um, successful and more apt to uh, progress. Um, as far as like the help goes, so I, I would have my kids tell me, um, they would, they would write even inside like their Google Classroom, Mrs. Crowley, I'm struggling with something, can we meet? And, you know, I would hold a meet with just them if I needed to. So uh, they became very good at asking for help from me. The parent role, absolutely, if, you know, you can. I know that many of you are working too, and um, it, it's more difficult, but I would definitely say that a routine and be systematic with it and definitely uh, asking your, your child, you know, is there a way for you to get help from your teacher because that's what we're here for and uh, making sure that um, you know you're giving them that opportunity to take that that lead and asking the teacher for the help first and then if they're not getting it then obviously you're gonna want to intervene you don't want them floundering but um, definitely you know reaching out to the teacher is the best solution mm -hmm. Okay, well, Connie, you already know your students well, and you will be having these same students in your classroom, correct? Um, I have four okay. new ones coming, and that's, yeah, and so it's different for sure. Yeah, so for teachers who are getting new students in their classroom, um, what are some tips to create community so that you can manage these Google Meets and manage online learning? Yeah, I am all about, again, um, creating consistency within your classroom so that your kids get used to that routine so that you can back out as the teacher and allow them the free time to work independently while you pull those small groups. And um, I, I, you know, 
build that community that, you know, we're all important inside this room. So we know that when I'm meeting with small group, it's their important time and it's not to be disrupted. And so creating, did you ask up here? Um, you know, did, you know, did you look through your resources? I give them opportunities to find an answer before they come to me. And before they come to me, I usually ask them if they've used those resources because it's really important for them to be, learn to become independent. Um, my kids aren't always perfect about that. Um, you know, my kids, uh, I, I sometimes have kids that have uh, special needs on top of being gifted. And sometimes they're having a complete meltdown and they are disrupting my whole entire classroom. And <laughs> I've had to leave and take care of those kind of things. So in a perfect world, you know, you're just going to, you're, you're going to train them up to be independent and um, self-reliant and uh, empower them to take charge of their own learning and give them the opportunities and the resources to do so. Mm -hmm. So um, a question about when uh, they leave you after sixth grade, what, where do they go? What happens to them since they've been in this nice um, self-contained classroom uh, with a wonderful teacher? What happens? Well, we have grown to seventh and eighth grade self-contained classroom now. So um, what we find is, is that we keep finding more and more kids late in the game. And so we're, our junior high uh, class is... Uh, usually, you know, eight, 18 is our, our break. And I know you're all going, what? You only have to have 18 kids in your room. But yes, um, 18 students is our max in our classrooms and our multi-age gifted classrooms. And I have more um, grade level band, but that's because we, we don't find as many gifted kids right away, or sometimes they transfer into our, our schools um, later in, um, so, the self-contained multi-age gifted classroom is seventh and eighth. With that, they uh, do go out to um, other classrooms. And a couple of the students by choice leave for multiple classes. Uh, but as it sits now, they only have to leave for uh, science in junior high. But we do have a couple of students that needed more social interaction, which we wanted to meet those needs. So they leave for uh, two different class periods. Okay, thank you. Um, one more question. Uh, you are an amazing advocate in your school district for gifted children. How, what, what is your approach and what advice do you have for a teacher who would like to do something like introduce Socratic seminar? Um, as part of their curriculum, or um, use make use of um, Melody Bondi's material. How do you approach your administrator to affect some change in the direction of education for gifted students? Because uh, we believe, and we've talked about this in AAGT, that this may be a perfect time uh, to change the direction of education for our gifted kids. So how do you approach that? Well, um Definitely data-driven decision-making seems to be the approach of most um, uh, school superintendents. And so uh, with that, um, when I had to do a little bit of research about, I can't do it all and I have so many grade levels and, and such, I had to just build my case. <laughs> um, so when I was talking about filling those gaps with that IXL program, I had to just do my due diligence for research about what do they say about kids that have had acceleration, so on and so forth. I just make sure that I come with my facts, my, um, my data-driven decision about the program that I chose, why I chose it, how it works, um, what will I do to monitor the progress of the students, how will I prove that that was worth the money, so on and so forth. You, you just have to make, you have to just have to appeal. It's, it's like setting up a case for trial. <laughs> <laughs> and you just have all your data and your facts and you, you, you drive that. And um, with enough convincing and, you know, passion behind your, you know, push, uh, generally they'll at least give you a try. And um, hopefully the data will come out the way that you were hoping that to, to make that, you know, the uh, assumption that that was going to fix the problem, which it did. Hence, we 
uh, we're able to continue using the program and um, this will be our third year now using it. And again, that data, it was really important in our district that that data rolls with the student. It doesn't start fresh every year. And that's why we chose that program because there's nothing more frustrated to gifted kids than taking these tests that um, over and over and trying to get back up to that level again because the computer is going to start them at, you know, fourth grade is if they're a fourth grader and then they've got to work all the way up to eighth grade because that's where they're working in whichever subject matter it is. So it's really important to um, uh, just do your research, fact driven and make sure that the, um, that, you know, th there's a big, there's a purpose for it. That what is, what is the purpose? Why do you want this or why is it needed? And how, what, what are the outcomes and the impacts for the students? Excellent. Well, Connie, you have been extremely helpful and I have learned a lot and I'm sure all of our participants today have as well. So Heather, I believe we have a reminder about um, uh, filling out a survey at the end um, here. And once you do, you'll be able to receive your certificate for attendance. So I uh, want to thank all of you for joining us. And um, Connie's uh, available for questions. And um, uh, you can email her directly at ccrowley at azgifted.com. So thank you, and I hope that you will join us next week for Scott Hagerman and Peter Lang, and have a very good week, everyone. Take care. Thank you.